Growing up in Wales, there wasn't much dance and not much ballet at all. I couldn't remember the official story as to how I got into dancing. So I just gave my mum a call and we were, we were chatting about how I initially got into it. And she remembers, it jogged my memory, at, at, at my primary school, we used to kind of do the, the Christmas shows or like the Easter show. And the teachers always said I was the one that could remember the steps. So they put me at the front of the line and it was like a, it was like a conga line. I remember being dressed as like an octopus or something. My mum had, had like put together this, this costume of like tights stuffed with newspaper. I've got, so I've got two older sisters who are like big role models, I think, in my life. Um, neither of them danced, but we were a lovely, like artistic, musical family. Both my sisters either sang or played the piano. We did a lot of arts and crafts as kids, and my mom was always lovely and supported that. So I had a, a friend um, who I was at primary school with, and she said, oh, I go to ballet classes, and our teacher is looking for boys to come and be in the, their production of The Nutcracker. And did I want to go? So I kind of, I think my mum was, she said she was a bit apprehensive about me going to ballet classes because like I was playing like touch rugby at the time and I wasn't loving it. Um, but I think she thought I might get a bit bullied. Um, but I think I was keen. I don't know why, I think I, I just thought I, there was something, something that intrigued me about it, and I think I didn't know any. I didn't know anything about this world at all, so I decided to go and and loved it. And I think my teacher Pamela Miller at, at the time she recognised something immediately. Um, again, I think it, she, she said she just knew he could just remember the steps, and I do have a memory of being stood at the back of the class in like a shorts and t-shirt and the teacher saying, okay, everyone stand in first. And I just looked around and like had a bit of a panic and then realized, okay, if I just copy what everyone else is doing, I might be okay. And then I seemed to just pick it up relatively quickly and did, did well in the um, like Shketi exams. That, the, that was the syllabus that we kind of learned. Just chatting to my mom again, she said I was, I did get a bit bullied at school when people found out. But she said that she spoke to my ballet teacher at the time, and so they spoke to the local newspaper. <laughs> and Bill, the film Billy Elliot had just come out. And I think they did a comparison of like, oh, Swansea's own Billy Elliot. And obviously my name is Billy, well, William, but my family called me Billy. So it was like a quite an easy comparison to make. And after that, everyone at school was fine. I think they, they recognized that it was a kind of a, I guess, a talent that was, that could be celebrated, which was great. I mean, I, I actually had no idea that that was how that came about. And my memories of, of getting bullied at school, I, like, I kind of remember them, but they're not, they're not vivid. I don't remember having a really terrible time because I think my, my mum and my ballet teacher were so kind of caring and really helped, like guided me through that, what could have been quite a difficult situation. I did ballet with my first ballet teacher for about two years and yeah, really enjoyed it. And, and then we, I, she suggested that I start the uh, Royal Ballet School Associate Programme. Um, so we would go once a month to Cardiff and then they moved to Bath. And so it was kind of becoming a bit more of a commitment. And I remember, I, I think I remember thinking, I had a moment where I was like, God, I'm just, can I just have fun? This all seems a little bit serious now. And we had to really travel because I used to just cycle down to our like local community centre and do, do classes. And it was all kind of low key and fun. And then when we were having to drive for like an hour and a half or two hours there and back on a weekend, I was like, oh, this is kind of, like I was, I, I was absolutely like soaking it up like a sponge, I'm sure, but it was, it felt like work, <laughs> or like no, it was um, it was serious. I think as we progressed through that, there was the auditions for the medium uh, mid associate, sorry, that was the same audition for the Royal Ballet School, and I knew I wanted to carry on with the associate program, and it was just it was the same audition, so I went along, 
and then we get into kind of the Royal Ballet School stage. I remember the audition process for the Royal Ballet School and I was not sure at all until we visited the school for the final audition and I remember thinking this is so unlike anything I've ever seen or experienced. I, I have to see what this is all about. I couldn't get my head around this, uh, this amazing building and what it represented. Um, but I don't think that was the case for my sister. Uh, I remember being in the car with her on the way back and she got really upset <laughs> because I think probably for the same reasons, because it was just so unlike anything any of us had experienced. And I think she thought, I think she was just scared, like a bit worried about losing her little brother and um, her like older sister caring instincts kind of kicked in and didn't want me to kind of go away to a, a boarding school at such a young age and change. And I don't know, I think she was worried. And at first, definitely had really bad homesickness and as did my mum. She, she got really upset but did not let on at all at the time. Um, but I know it, she really struggled with sending her little 11 year old boy away. Um, I don't think they would have chosen to send me to boarding school had it not been for this kind of once in a lifetime opportunity. We had some really brilliant teachers, so Hope Keelan kind of nurtured us and became our second mum in our first year. Um, but that's not to say she wasn't, you know, tough. And it was a big step up for, I would say, yeah, pretty much all of us in terms of how long we trained, the how long we academically worked for. I remember the, some of the weird differences were I had gone to a primary school that was taught in, everything was taught in the Welsh language. So all of my maths and, and science and, and arts were in Welsh. And we were, we spoke Welsh all day. So I went into my first maths class and I was like, I don't know, I haven't learned any of this in English. And I didn't realise that would be an issue until I got there. And obviously it was, it was, it took. I guess a couple of months for me to kind of figure everything out. Um, but that was like a, one of the kind of weird changes. Um, I think one of the things I remember the most about the Royal Ballet School is just those moments of fun in the kind of, um, we did a, a, a class called Expressive Arts and there was, there were, there were a group of four of us that seemed to just mess around successfully, just bounce loads of ideas around and we'd kind of, the, the goal of the class was to come up with a bit of a performance, I guess, and I have such fond memories of that, of that time and the, the friends that I made. It's bad that this isn't about the ballet side, isn't it? But it's about, it was about, I think it was just about like the creative side and it was a creative outlet for us because the dance was so rigorous and, and, and amazing. And I know that that, I, I think I had a lot of energy that was channeled into dance. And uh, speaking to my mum, she said, you were wild, like you were, and you, I guess speaking to people now, you wouldn't really think it. I don't think I come across as a particularly wild person, but I think all of that energy I had as a, as a, as a kid was directed and really focused into dance and they said it was the one thing that I would really focus on and I've always thought that's because it's so there's so much to learn and there's there's so much to um, keep learning that it just it does take so much focus to to really kind of do it well yeah moving on to the upper school was another big shock in terms of workload um, there was just so many more hours of dance in the day. The uh, director at the time, Gaylene Stock, she uh, called me into her office and said, look, I'd like to send you to the Youth America Grand Prix. And I remember from the previous year, it had been like Ben Ella and Vadim that had gone and like won all the medals. And I was like, oh, right, okay. Um, are you sure? Because I, 
I can't do what they can do. And she suggested that I do the, the Adagio solo from Swan Lake, um, which is different. And I think it was probably like a bit of a good tactic on her part, because she knew she'd been, a, she'd been an adjudicator of that competition for, I suppose, for a few years, and knew that that sort of solo wasn't really performed that often. Um, so yeah, we went along, me and Claudia Dean, and had this really crazy time in New York seeing all of these incredible dancers that could jump over your head and spin around you 15 times. And I remember it was a bit daunting because, uh, yeah, I mean, I knew that wasn't my strong point at the time. So I guess Gaylene's tactics paid off and I ended up winning that, which was a, a shock because I think I'd done it quite, performed it quite badly in the final. And I remember being a bit upset and that she sl slid a note under my hotel room door saying, um, I know you weren't pleased with the performance, but they'd love you to perform it again in the gala at the end of the whole competition. And I was like, great, OK, I've got a chance to kind of make up for myself. I got there and I was chatting to one of the other guys who was in the gala and he said, oh, well, great. I mean, you know, at least we all know we've won something because they don't ask us to perform in the gala unless you've won a prize. And I was like, great, great. Maybe there's like a nice third there or, you know, I'd be happy with whatever. time so I'd actually already been offered a place in Birmingham Royal Ballet. The director David Bintley had offered me a contract there that was supposed to start in the um, after the Christmas holiday and uh, I, we'd had, had the conversation with Gaylene and she'd suggested that we wait because there was also a tour to Canada at the end of the year that she wanted me to do. Um, so luckily I was able to kind of delay that contract to start after I'd finished my schooling but there was definitely a panic of like what if they say oh actually no if it's not now then don't worry <laughs> um, so yeah it was nice I could just really enjoy that last part of the school year knowing that I would have a job which is stressful especially right now I think that's a huge that must be a huge stress for students graduating now or for the next I guess a few couple of years or I just can't imagine after so many years of training coming into um, a kind of a workplace that's so unsettled. So I guess I just look back at that time and feel so lucky that I had that opportunity that was just so relatively stress-free and, and, and easy. I joined Birmingham Royal Ballet in 2010 and um, I remember being so keen not to like mess anything up, not to annoy anyone and to just know what I was doing. Um, and our first productions were Romeo and Juliet. So it was my, that was my first introduction to a full, being part of a full length Kenneth, Kenneth McMillan ballet. And it was amazing. I loved every second of it. The quick changes, uh, like going to the ball, and then just seeing and learning the, just le yeah, learning about how the dancers portray those roles. And there's a moment that sticks out in my head, and it is all it is is in the ballroom, and it's Caroline Miller doing the just like the little fifths, and just the way like just the way she did that. I thought, gosh, there's. It was one of those moments where you realise how much you can say in so little movement just through like, the way she held herself and like, the speed she did it and like, the look that she kind of snuck across at the Romeo. And there were so many moments like that and it was, a bit, it was this amazing, um, 
as I as I kind of moved through the company, there was a there was a bit of a th like thrown in at the deep end, and given given roles like the dream or there were, I did one show of symphonic variations at the very end of the tour because I think one of the dancers had gotten injured just before the last show, and I was only covering it, and I knew it. Um, and did one rehearsal and, and went in, and it was really like a case of there was a lot of like there was so I realized how much trust they put in me to to do and perform some of these roles like really early on, and it was um, but it, and it was like part terrifying but part like I kind of didn't know any better in, in lots of ways and and was able to. Give it a go, and, and then and learn then from the ballet staff and friends that watched the show. I remember getting some amazing notes from my friend James Barton after an early show or rehearsal of the Dream, and he was like, "The dancing's great, you know. I'm not like curious to talk about that, but it, those those mime sections are so important." And he was like, "You're doing them all well, but if I was sat at the back of the auditorium, I wouldn't know." I don't think I'd be able to, to read what you were saying. So it's so, like it's so much bigger, and like learning that side of how to tell a story to a theater. And I guess that's what's strange now is that we are, you try to balance that with a lot of the film work that we do, so the cinema relays. And it's, it is sometimes tricky to know where to judge that because do you? Do you play it to the, the audience? But you also need to remember that there are going to be some really kind of close-up shots and they will be able to read things like just the movement of your eyes or where you're looking. Um, so it's interesting. And, we, and, and obviously we do a lot of um, dance specifically for film, which is you can really kind of you can use that to your advantage again and, and kind of explore how little you need to do. I had the chance to dance a couple of like big Ashton ballets, the, the dream obviously being one. And um, the first time I danced it with Natasha Outrid, she was a joy and I just, she was able to impart so much knowledge about how to perform Ashton and what it needed. And a lot of the time it was just watching her and watching her, like the importance she put on the, her upper body and how she used that was amazing. I think sometimes it's kind of trying not to dwell too much on the technical side of it and, but, and getting the, the, that like magic that's there. I've, I've worked a couple of times with Anthony Dowell as well. Uh, the last time I performed it in, in Birmingham was with um, Jenna Roberts and Anthony came in and coached us and it's amazing he can still do it <laughs> that like it was that was a few years ago now but he would demonstrate something and you would you would just think wow that that is that, that is exactly how I would like to do it even now <laughs> but I yeah I mean I, I love them they're like they're just kind of bigger than life and you can you can go a bit over the top with them and that that's part of it, that's what they, that's kind of what a lot of them are about. If we're talking about symphonic variations, that's not what it's about. It is so, it is so understated and it is just, it's all about the technique. And I love that, it's just a completely different challenge. It's, I mean, I only danced it once, so I'm like pretending like I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but I've watched it since then so many times. And um, yeah, it's just a, it's like a, it's like watching a masterpiece kind of being painted in front of you. I first danced uh, Romeo and Juliet with Delia Matthews in Birmingham, and um, we were coached on it by Desmond Kelly, and he there was once one rehearsal and I remember him saying it's the moment you run on before the balcony pas de deux and he was like you are facing the back so your back has to tell us everything about what is about to happen 
And it, like it was just moments like that that are so, that are so important, and that he he was able to identify because he knew the ballet so well, and he could he just had a really great eye for knowing um, for like picking out those key moments that are just so important, and that that can say so much. Like I said about kind of Caroline's uh, kind of Bure's coming forward, um, and that was. That was a big old shock, I think, dancing that. Uh, I guess, how old was I? I must have been 20, early 20s. It was like a crash course in how to do a full length ballet because it was one of the first ones I'd done. Now I realize it was a really hard one to start off with. Um, but obviously it was like this, this amazing learning experience. Cut to my time at the Royal Ballet and, and they kind of, they announced that Michael Nunn and William Trevitt are, are casting to do a film version of Romeo and Juliet. Um, and I was lucky enough to be chosen. And, and I think part of it was because I knew that I'd done it before I, and I knew the choreography and I, I had a version of Romeo in my head that I could tap into immediately when we, we had a session where we did some screen testing. Just to, and they kind of give us a, gave us a couple of scenes to do, like entering the ball with Mercutio and Benvolio, and the fight scene with Tibble. And I remember thinking, oh, okay, you know, I think I remember the, the sword fighting. I remember the Twyla, and then I remember like it was okay, and I could kind of get into it, which was great. And and um, but it was like it was a the actual filming of it was 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 probably one of the highlights of my career so far, I think. It just felt like you could get lost in the story so easily because your surroundings were physically there. Maybe it was because on stage you are having to use your imagination and there is this big void where the audience is that you have to ima almost imagine isn't there. And, and that takes up a lot, a big part of, I guess, brain power to, to almost filter, filter through that and, and create your own kind of little four walls and, and, and space when you're on stage. Whereas we didn't have to do any of that. So we could almost like, it was so, it was really freeing because all of that work had been done for you and really well. So you could just be so in the moment. And then also, so a, a, acting for film, you, you realize that you didn't have to project all of these emotions right to the back of the amphitheater of the Royal Opera House, which is far. It's really, it's like, you, you, you can't really, You'd, you have to really go, go for it in order to project that far. Whereas the cameras just could pick up these sort of minuscule details and you, we could play the characters so naturally, which was scary because I had, I was obviously dancing opposite Francesca and she is c completely captivating. And this kind of just took it to the next level because it was completely natural and it was, the same experience with with Matt Ball when we were doing the, those fight scenes. It was terrifying. It was really genuinely quite scary. <laughs> we filmed um, Romeo and Juliet Beyond Words in a film studio in Budapest, and I think it was um, it had been originally the set was this, this kind of Italian town that had been built for I think it was a TV series. They'd visited it and seen its potential and then obviously did so much work in refurbishing some of the set and digging in our floors and kind of decorating it appropriately. Michael and Billy, uh, they edited some of the choreography and some of the music and we rehearsed it to a track that um, had been put together that had been kind of cut so that included all of the, the big putters and then they had to decide 
which was a pretty difficult job, which sections to kind of take out in order to turn it into a 90 minute film. So yeah, we rehearsed to a, a recorded track. Some of the tempos were a bit off and I remember they said, it's absolutely fine, you can kind of dance a bit off the music because we're gonna film, film it all and then we'll um, take it into the studio, edit it together and then uh, will record the orchestra and it was Kuhn Kessels who had the film in front of him and was conducting to us and it was what it was it did feel a bit unnatural doing some of the choreography so off the music and it was like that jarring like this is so this feels so wrong to be do, dancing off this off the off the timing of the recorded track and just hoping <laughs> that it would kind of come out Okay, in the end, which it absolutely did, I think the orchestra sound particularly amazing in that film. We had a schedule of all of the different scenes and it was roughly in chronological order but obviously there were huge breaks in between some scenes so I think it was just before each scene I had to remember okay where have I just come from how if we'd already filmed it how did I end like what tone did I end that last scene so I'm not coming into this new scene like as a completely in a complete completely different place there was a moment actually when we were filming the ballroom scene and it was all quite late at night. It was, I think it was like half 10 or 11 p.m. And something had happened with, I was just about to do that kind of tricky ballroom solo and one of the lights or one of the cameras, something went wrong or it was too windy. I can't remember what, but like Michael called cut and said, can we all just come back in like an hour? And I was like, oh, I think I'm going to rely on some caffeine to get me through to like midnight and then do this solo again. So it was like just remaining flexible in all the senses. <laughs> in terms of I just put loads of clothes on to try and keep warm. And yeah, just had a couple of coffees. <laughs> but it was like, it was thrilling, like dancing outside, dancing ballet outside. We don't do that that often. And it's actually... Yes, yeah, it was it was amazing. Like you could look up and see the moon and it was kind of there was a breeze going through your hair and there were kind of like flies and mosquitoes everywhere, but it felt it felt pretty real. <laughs> when I first joined the Royal Ballet, I was um honestly like terrified, I think. I was I was just it was a bit overwhelming. Uh, I guess in many ways there, there were just, I was now amongst so many dancers that I'd looked up to for years. Like I remember my first class being stood behind Alessandra Ferry and that was a little bit mind-blowing. Um, there, there was a show <laughs> that we were doing of um, Christopher Wielden's Alice's Adventures in Wonderland and I was doing The Caterpillar <laughs> and I think I just put so much pressure on myself for it to go really well uh, that I completely blanked on stage and ended up doing the same choreography over and over again. And I, that, I've never done that before. I don't think I've done that since. And I realized, wow, I need to just chill out. Nothing's different. I'm not gonna magically kind of improve as a dancer overnight and like, I think I just had set myself this a bit of an unachievable goal um, instead of enjoying this experience, my like, first time as part, first time dancing on the opera stage as part of the Royal Ballet. Um, yeah, so that was a bit of a disaster. Um, but they were lovely. Like Kevin and Chris came back and said, oh, you could have picked a better section of choreography to repeat. <laughs> um, but yeah, that, that was, that was a, it was like a nice wake up call of just, I need, I need to just enjoy this. And that's been, I think, a con bit of a, bit of a, not battle, but something that I just tried to remember 
not to put too much pressure on myself and, and enjoy these experiences as much as I can because they will, it will be over really, really soon in, in the grand scheme of a dancer's career. They're not that, they're not that long.